Hi, I'm Elaine Petricelli from Book Passage, and I have the privilege of working with Dominican University of California on these wonderful events that we get to do together, uh, especially with Dr. Denise Lucy, who always makes everything I need to have happen, happen. It's an amazing university, and we're very, very proud to be with Dominican University. I have all the exciting things to tell you. The first thing I have to tell you is please turn off your cell phone. And uh, so I, I just remembered to turn off mine. So. Uh, and we'd also love your feedback about tonight's presentation uh, or any others that you've attended here at Dominican uh, because it helps us do a better job in future. And any suggestions, please, the ushers would love to have your feedback, and they have forms that you can fill. Um, as you know, uh, Craig Robinson, I, it, and wait till you meet him, he's just yummy, um, is going to be in conversation with Brian Copeland. When, they are, when Brian and Craig are uh, finished with their conversation, we will have the opportunity for questions. So if you have a question, please put it on a card. The ushers will pick it up, and I will have the exciting job of handing them to Brian. Uh, I also wanted to let you know that if you have friends who couldn't come tonight, or if you would like to hear the uh, presentation again, you can go to radio.dominican.edu, and you'll be able to hear the presentation. Uh, that's radio.dominican.edu. I hope you'll all come tomorrow night as well because we have another presentation tomorrow night in Angelica Hall celebrating the final event of our one book, One Marin. And as you know, we have all been reading Michael Shabin's The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, and he will be in conversation with Michael Krasny tomorrow. So, when we're all done with all those things, we'll be signing books, and we'll have a table right down in front of the podium here, and the ushers will help everyone get up, and everybody's book will be signed. Brian's books are for sale over at the table, and uh, he's not a genuine black man, and so you can get those too if you would like them. Uh, I am very glad you're here, and I want to turn this over to the president of the university, another person who always says yes to all of our crazy ideas and who has made this university grow so much, Dr. Joseph Fink. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to the university and to welcome you to this special edition to the leadership I'm sorry, to the Institute for Leadership Studies Spring Lecture Series. The Institute hosts public forums that actively engage the community in socially relevant discussions and at the same time attempts to inspire effective leadership. Uh, as Elaine mentioned, this Leadership uh, Studies uh, Lecture Series is in cooperation with Book Passage and we're very pleased to have that arrangement and partnership. Uh, the Institute for Leadership Studies, uh, which is led by Dr. Denise Lucy, has done a remarkable job in the last several years of facilitating positive individual, organizational, and societal change. Uh, without going into great detail about it, its uh, mission basically is to make people better leaders. And it's doing that in a wide variety of ways, both on the campus and off the campus. Tonight, there are a number of people in the audience who are special guests I'd like to recognize because they fit into the category of leaders. First of all, I'd like to welcome and acknowledge Janet Carter, the Executive Director of Team Up uh, for Youth, and one of her trustees, Joan Ryan, is here tonight. So, Janet, nice seeing you. And, and I've lost sight of Joan, but she's here. Also, I'd like, uh, like to mention the fact that uh, Joan's husband, Comcast Sports, Net Area announcer Barry Tompkins is here, and he's with his boss, Comcast Sportsnet Bay Area General Manager Ted Riggs. We're very glad to have you here with us tonight as well. Thank you. The uh, 
We'd also like to recognize the members of the Phoenix Project of Marin who are our special guests here tonight. Wave your hands, Phoenix Project folks. Good. And of course, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Penguin, the Penguin Group and Gotham Books uh, for their support in bringing Coach Robinson here with us uh, this evening. Uh, I also do want to do one other thing. I want to thank all of our student athletes and other student volunteers who are here tonight to help make this happen. So wave students and athletes and so, uh, say thank you. For, thanks for doing what you do. In order to, uh, to introduce Craig Robinson, I'd like to introduce uh, a dear friend and a devoted uh, trustee, former trustee, John, where are you? Come up here, John. John Allen was chairman of the Board of Trustees here uh, for uh, five years and was on the board for probably 14 years altogether. And it was hard work, uh, his hard work, and his inspiration and, and the great deal of dedication that he had for the institution that helped make it grow and develop the way it is today. Uh, during his years here as chairman, the institution almost tripled in size and budget uh, went up fivefold. We raised $60 million into a host of other things. So he's truly a friend of the university and he's a great personal friend of mine. But there's something I have to tell you about him. John, John used to be an athlete and he played football, hockey, basketball, a variety of other sports. And his wife told me recently that he was home with her in the bedroom. He was standing in front of a full-length mirror, nude, looking at himself. And he turned around and said, Beth, Beth, I'm looking at this mirror. And, you know, the muscle tone's disappearing. I'm getting a pot. The hair's getting gray. My eyes are bagging. It's just, Beth, I need a compliment. And Beth turned and looked at him and said, well, you have perfect eyesight, my dear. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a dear friend and a dear ally of this institution, John Allen. Well, I was going to start out and thank, thank Dr. Fink, but I think I'll skip that part now. <clears throat> But thanks to all of you for coming tonight and being part of this momentous uh, first-of-a-kind event here at the Conlon Center. Um, in his book, A Game of Character, Craig Robinson celebrates the inspiring fam family, teachers, mentors, and coaches who have shaped his life. The book is a tribute to his mother, Marion, and his late father, Fraser, and it is a tribute to his younger sister, Michelle the First Lady of the United States and the wife of the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama. <clears throat> I had right there said, pause for applause. <clears throat> uh, always a line that gets applause, at least in Marin County, right? Um, it is also a tribute to his community of friends and supporters who have positively influenced his life and careers in business and basketball. All helped Craig build the fundamentals for a foundation of success and character that has carried him from the south side of Chicago to the Ivy League, to the national stage at the 2008 Democratic Convention, and to a place where we probably never imagined he'd be with us tonight at the Conlon Center at the Dominican University of California. Our program tonight begins with a sit-down conversation between two great men, Craig Robinson and Brian Copeland. Brian is a Bay Area personality who hosts his own show on Sunday mornings on KGO Radio. He is also a comedian, a playwright, an actor, and an author who wrote Not a Genuine Black Man and then turned it into a one-man show of the same name in 2004. Brian also appeared with such artists as Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, Natalie Cole, 
and in the movie, The Bucket List. I'm still working on my bucket list a little bit. But <clears throat> Tonight, he is co-starring with Craig Robinson. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Brian Robins, uh, I mean, Brian Copeland and our honored guest, Craig Robinson. Thank you. Thanks, John. Really nice of you. Thanks a lot. All right. Wait for you to sit down so we're the same height. He's a tall See, man. Now you're taller than me because I'm all legs. <laughs> Well, it is a pleasure uh, to meet you. I, I feel like I've, I've taken a crash course in Craig Robinson over the course of the last two weeks. <laughs> I found out we got a lot of things in common. For example, um, if this is accurate, your birthday is April 21st, last yes. Wednesday. Mine too. No way. Mine too, last Wednesday. So wow. happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. I got you the same thing you got me. That's right. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Well, uh, the book is uh, a game of character, of course, and I should put this here for everybody to see, and uh, you'll be signing this uh, after the program, and it is, uh, it's a really great and, and inspirational read. Um, of course, you talk a lot about, in it about uh, your sister and your relationship uh, with your sister and your brother-in-law, and just to start, I've, I've got to ask you this question. My, my, my sister was, was crowned the very first African-American Mrs. California a couple of years ago. We're about two years apart, same as you and your sister. Okay. And once they put a crown on her head, there was no living with her. Now, they put a bigger crown on your sister's head. <laughs> Has, are, 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 are things the same? In, in terms of your dynamic, you're always so close based on what it is that you write. Yeah, well, things are not the same. Well, of course, there's this whole bubble. But, uh, but she is the same person. Uh, and, you know, I, I write about in a game of character how my sister grew up her entire life being Craig Robinson's little sister. As I was the firstborn, good student, she had the same teacher, she had to hear, well, Craig did this and Craig did that, and then I started playing basketball and other different sports, and all my friends, none of my friends knew her name. They all just called her Craig's little sister. Oh, you're Craig's sister. And I can't tell you how wonderful it is to be Michelle Obama's big brother. Oh, that's great. That's great. Now, you were first uh, introduced to the, uh, the non-basketball world uh, at the, uh, the Democratic National Convention when you introduced your sister. Uh, and it was, it was, you know, the warmth and, and the closeness really came out in, in, in terms of your introduction. And it was, uh, from what you write, it was during that introduction that you decided that you were going to, to write this book. Tell us a little bit why. What was it about that moment that made you decide, you know, I've got to write this down? Well, it... it Brian, it started 19 years ago when my dad passed away. My dad passed away in, the, in March of 19 years ago, and uh, he had been the keeper of the family folklore. Mm -hmm. He was the guy who told the stories about, oh, my great-grandfather walked four miles to school, and my grandfather had to walk two miles to school, and that kind of thing, and, and he was the person who at the family holidays, everybody gathered around to hear the stories. And when he passed away, I thought to myself, after grieving, I said, I've got to start chronicling these stories because I want to be able to share the lessons that I've learned from him with my children and, sh and my sister, have her share them with her children and our cousins and so on. So it was, you jump ahead to when I was introducing my sister at the Democratic National Convention, I was standing backstage before it started and I thought to myself, man, what would my dad think of this moment right here? Because first of all, I didn't think I should have been there. I shouldn't have been introducing her. I told, when they asked me to introduce her, I thought they were kidding. But you say they, who asked you? Uh, the uh, campaign staff. Oh, the campaign staff. They, campaign she didn't come to you first, the campaign staff did. Came to me and said, we want you to introduce your sister. And I said, yeah, you're kidding, right? Who wants to hear from a basketball coach? You guys should get Oprah Winfrey or Brian Copeland or somebody, you know? Yeah, and, Oprah or Brian, either or. We both have the same <laughs> clout. So, but I, I was honored to be asked, and, uh, and again, I was standing back there, and I was thinking to myself, boy, my dad would really be proud of this. And that's when I started, I said to myself, I have to write this book before I won't write it, or I won't be able to write it. And a, a, when I was putting together 
my thoughts, I was trying to understand and, and remember what makes a person memorable, like a Frazier Robinson, or like a good teacher you had, or a good boss that you've had, somebody who inspires you, and it all boils down to character. And a game of character is basically a love letter to my parents whose life lessons resonate with people on the ball field, on the basketball court, but also in the boardroom and even at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. Now you write in the book that uh, you can tell a lot or you learned a lot from your father about how you can really tell a lot about a person's character and how they conduct themselves throughout life based upon how they conduct themselves on the basketball court. Right. Hey, can you go into that, elaborate on that a little bit for me? You know, my, my dad always said, and as far, as, I, as far back as I can remember, even before I was a real basketball player, he used to say, you know, you can really tell a person's personality on how they play pickup basketball. And when I was younger, I didn't understand, but as I started playing, I, he would explain what he meant. I mean, you can tell if a person's selfish. How? Well, a guy who doesn't pass the ball to the guy who's open. That's an indication, yeah. That's certainly. selfish. You can tell if a guy's egotistical. If he takes a shot that he knows he can't make, but he's trying to impress somebody. You can tell if a person has integrity. You know, pickup basketball is a, and I know a lot of you out there might have played, most people have played pickup basketball. It's a self-regulating game. You have to call your own calls, and you have to give up your own your calls that people make to you. And there are plenty of people who don't like giving up calls. You can tell if somebody's a team player or not. Mm -hmm. So these things I, was, I found out as I, I found out from my father beforehand and as I started playing more and more basketball. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about your relationship with the president a little bit later on, but this does lead me into a story I want you to talk about where uh, your sister, after she'd been dating um, a Mr. Obama for about a year, uh, pretty much asked you to vet him by, by taking him out on the basketball court right. in a pickup game to watch how he played. Yeah. So, so tell me what you observed based upon uh, what it is that you just uh, said, how you just described sure, your conduct sure. on the court. It, it happened just like that. My sister grew up in the same household, so she heard this story about how you can tell a guy's personality. And uh, my sister hadn't really had a long-term boyfriend. They were all pretty much sort of, you know, three months, six months, maybe nine months, but never anything long-term. So she's dating this guy for longer than anybody we had ever seen. And she comes to me one day and says, hey, listen, Barack fashions himself a basketball player. Why don't you take him out on the court and see what kind of guy he is? And I was like, no way. You do your own dirty work. <laughs> Because I liked him. I thought he was a nice guy. He was smart. <laughs> he, was, he was tall. He was a good guy. He was funny. And, 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 you know, he's one of these Harvard Law guys who didn't tell you he was a Harvard Law guy. See, they don't get that. Cause, see, yeah, because usually first Harvard Law minutes. School guys always, the first thing out of their mouth is, I went to Harvard Law School. It's like, come on, man. All right. Uh, so I liked him, so I, I refused, and, and, and... And we should mention, too, you know, for those who don't know, that you were a Princeton, a Princeton star, a right, Princeton basketball right. star, so this is, you know, take him out, and you could really She wanted me to take him out. You know, I play with real players. Now, I can't just be taking guys to my pickup game. And... <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask, too, but I guess that's not the question. Well, of course, my sister being persistent, and we are extremely close, and I talk about this in a game of character, how... Um, I acquiesced and I took him out there and I was nervous at first but what I found was that he was quietly confident he, he had high integrity he, he called the right calls he gave up the calls the floor of the game was perfect uh, he was honest was he upset when he missed a shot well not overly upset. He was disappointed that he missed the shot, but he'd run back and play defense like guys should do when they miss a shot. How about if he got fouled? If he got fouled, he, he called a foul. And, and what I liked about him, most times, if he got fouled, he didn't call it every time. That's, that's good. He wants to keep the game going. So he had the right pickup etiquette. But uh, Brian, the best thing, the thing that told me a lot about him was that 
he did not try and pass me the ball every single time down the court just to impress me to go back to my sister. Now, you guys are chuckling, but that was important. If he had tried to suck up to me like that, I'd have been like, nah, this guy's a phony. <laughs> and he's a politician. Well, no, he, was, he, he, was, he wasn't a politician. No, not then. at that point he was At that point, he was just some guy. I wouldn't be sitting here telling you this story if he, you know, if, if he didn't end up running for president of the United States. I'd be sitting here, I would have still written a book, but the story about him would have been out of there. You know, isn't that funny how things yes. work out? But that's how, and, and I didn't even know what the word vet meant back then, so it wasn't like I was trying, I was just doing my sister a favor. And so you went back to her and you said what? I said, this guy, is, it, it, it seems like he's a really good guy. He handled himself on the court very well, and you know, at least we can't 86 him because of the basketball. <laughs> And she was like, okay, and you know, she, she just wanted to see what he would be like when she wasn't around. And he was terrific. And you talk about how you, you learned a lot about character from your parents, and, and again, basketball being a big part of that, uh, and how basketball can teach you a lot about character. Now, in terms of, uh, if, if you look apart from the two obvious things, which are, are hard work, and a, a, a work ethic and commitment. What other things did, oh. did you learn from them in terms of, of, of how this can, can build character and show character? You know, when, when I think about character, I think about uh, how my dad used to talk about knowing how to operate, knowing how to behave, doing the right thing no matter who's watching you. That's a big part of character for me. And and it's not just sort of the, the things that you mentioned, you're right. It's, it's also the emphasis on education. Mm -hmm. let's, let's stop and talk about that for a minute because okay. education was, you know, you grew up on the south side of Chicago and uh, in an apartment right. um, with, uh, with your mother and father and you and your sister shared a room until high school, I, I understand, shared, shared a room together until high school. And your parents really stressed education. Now, being African American and mm -hmm. living in that community, what was that like? Did you get that? You know that uh, you know your family is Sididi. We were talking about this backstage yeah, for right. those. Who, we should explain what Sididi means for people who don't know. Uh, that, that means it's it's an African American term. It means you put on airs. You think you're better than everybody else. Right. Or you're trying to act white because you're being educated. You right. skipped the third grade. You did right. so well academically. Was there that kind of pressure in your neighborhood? Uh, you know. Back then, there was not, and, and what, what I talk about in the game of character, because my mom made me put it in there, was that she, she wanted everyone to know that she wasn't doing anything that the other parents weren't, were, weren't trying to do. They were all trying to make a better life for their children, and she says she just got lucky. But I know otherwise, I know that my mom and dad's focus on academics was a big part of our success. And there were a few kids, but, but, but it's a few, you know, who said, oh, you're trying to act white because you're trying to talk proper and uh, things of that nature, but we didn't care. We wanted to do well. And the reason why we wanted to do well was because our parents never forced us to get good grades. We weren't graded with, with, on, on our grades. We were graded on our hard work. And in a game of character, we talk about, or I talk about how we were only asked by my parents to do the best you could do. And then what they said were, the grades will come if you're doing your best. Now, speaking of doing your best, there's a story in the book that I just love. And that is, I, I forget how old you were, but you were taking sex education class. Oh, my. And, and you, got, you got a 99, and they called your parents because they wanted to know why you got a 99 on sex education. Right. And your, and your parents wanted to know, well, tell the story. Your parents wanted you to yeah. explain to them. Yeah, Br yeah, Brian will have the story all turned around. They, actually, what <laughs> happened, what happened was back in the day, they used to teach sex education in sixth grade. Now, this, this, and, and, in the book, I talk about how it's really a, a discussion about openness with your kids. And my parents were never the type to say, because I said so, or we'll talk about that later. 
They always took the time to explain everything when you had an interest. So before sixth grade, I wanted to know where babies came from, and, and it was one of those times my mom was doing the dishes, my dad was sitting at the kitchen table, and I was like, well, so where do babies come from? And they got into this long discussion about where babies came from. So when I got to sixth grade, we start sex education, and they give you a test before they start to see, gauge where everybody's knowledge is. And it was a real easy test. It was 50 words, and you had to put them in three categories, male, female, or both. So since I had had this tutorial, I got all of them right except one word. And this is why the story is funny. It's menstruation. And I put it under male because it had men in it. <laughs> I, I didn't, you know, somehow I missed that technical term. So the, the, the teacher I had teaching the course was absolutely mortified that I got a 99 or whatever, a 98, whatever it was. So she called my mom to find out how the heck I knew what I knew. And so my mom subsequently explained to her, well, you know, we talked to our kids and it's a legit 99. He didn't cheat or anything like that. And it, 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 it makes for a story about being open and honest with your kids. And are you, as, you know, you've got, you've got a, a baby. How, how, how old's the youngest one? The youngest is three and a half months and the, and the two older ones are 18 and 14. Okay, did you have the same talk? Were you, did you sit down and have the openness talk, or did you? I, I tried to, but my kids were like, "Don't! Why? Well, we don't want to hear that from you." <laughs> my, I, now I, I couldn't put this story in the book because my daughter would have killed me. But uh, I tried to have the, the, the talk about menstruation with my daughter before she had it, and I made the mistake of trying to have that discussion in a restaurant, so she. She, in a restaurant? In a restaurant. What, a fine dining restaurant or like the drive-thru? No, it was, it was a sit-down restaurant, but it wasn't fine dining. And I thought we were kind of on our own. And my, my wife was like, I can't believe you brought that up in the restaurant. <laughs> so I took that honesty thing a little too far. There's a time and a place. <laughs> you said that uh, your, your mother and your sister both read the book, uh, yes. read the manuscript, and that had they not approved it, and your mother wrote the foreword as well, and had they not approved it, uh, you wouldn't have, have published it. Okay, just between you and me, I feel like Connie Chung, just between us right uh -huh. here, was there anything that was left out because they said, you, you, you can't put this oh, in? Oh, no, here? no, you know, uh, no, no, not at all. I, would, I wanted them not only to... to approve it, but I wanted them to be proud of it. And I wanted to tell the kinds of story, stories that were uplifting and inspirational. And I wanted them to be proud. And uh, there was nothing that after I handed in the manuscript, uh, or, or after I let them read the, the, the manuscript, that they said, okay, you got to take this out. Uh, the only thing was what my mom said, that she said, you make me sound too good in here. You have to tell them that everybody was doing what I was doing. That's what she wanted me to add. And when I was done with it and gave it to her, she was, she was so proud that she agreed to write the forward, which is a wonderful forward. Yes, it is. Uh, and, and you guys have to understand, getting my mom to do anything publicly is like, uh, it's worse than pulling out a wisdom tooth. It's just, it's hard to get her to do. She's really been in the, in the background. I'm trying to think if I can, other than the convention, ever remember having seen her on television or, or she certainly, as far as I know, sat down for an interview or, or anything. But she writes it in the forward about how, uh, how your sister wanted her to move into the White House, and she didn't want to do it. And so yeah. your sister came to you to talk her into it. Right, right. That's exactly how it went. Uh, my sister, you, know, you have to understand, my mom is the type of, she, she's the type of in-law who doesn't want to be intrusive. And when we were both living in Chicago, my sister and me, we would vie for her. One of us wanted her to move in with us and sort of do what she's doing now, and she absolutely refused. And she said, I'll come over and babysit for as long as you want, but I'm not moving in. And that's because she felt that your nuclear family time was an important time, and she didn't want to be an intruder. 
And that's why it was hard to get her to, to agree to move to the White House. And so my sister couldn't do it, and so she asked me to do it. And you took her out on the court. Yeah, and I backed her down, <laughs> and I forced her. No, uh, no, what I did was I went through my explanation about how it's really important to Michelle and Barack that the kids have some kind of normal upbringing. They're going to be busy. They're going to need somebody to watch the kids anyway. Why don't you do it? And don't worry about disappointing They're going to need yourself. somebody to watch the kids. Yeah, well, well they're going to need somebody to sort of, when they're off doing things, because the kids are still young. But there's still Secret Service and people around, aren't, aren't there? All right. All right need somebody to raise, help raise nurture the kids, them. Okay, nurture them. I mean, okay. you don't want guys walking around with guns like, hey, here, play with us. You know? <laughs> uh, but my... my <laughs> they take the clip out first. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Uh, my, my, uh, and my mom was like, she was absolutely against it. And that's when I said, hey, it's going to be temporary. And she thought about it for a minute. And she was like, okay, as long as it's temporary. So don't tell her, but it's temporary. <laughs> it's not really temporary. She's going to do it as long as they, hopefully it's temporary for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> how, um, how many times uh, have, have, have you uh, spent the night there? Twice. That's all. But that's only because my schedule is the way it is, and we live in Oregon, and they live in Washington, D.C. My kids have been over there a lot. They've been on Air Force One. They've done all the kind of stuff you would, you would think that I would do if I could. Um, so I've, I've only spent the night a couple of times. And where do you stay? Where do you think yeah. I stay? The Lincoln bedroom. That's where I stay. <laughs> it's got the biggest bed. It, the bed is long. Because Lincoln was like 6'8". So it's perfect. It's perfect. Well, it's really a... Uh, I, I joke about it. It's just it not... It is not uh, I still can't believe it. When you go over their house, you're at the White House. I mean, who, who does that? I mean, it's just... <laughs> it's you know, bizarre, it's isn't it? bizarre. Well, what's it like in terms of security? And everything? I mean, like, you know, you're known. You're, 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 the, you're the brother of the First Lady. You're, you're, you're the, the, the head coach at Oregon State. You know, you're not like... You're not Billy Carter. They don't have to worry no, about you no, at all in no, any way, no, shape, no. or form. No. You know, so, so I mean, what... I, I mean, what, what is it, it, it like in terms, in terms of security for you? To, to, to go in there since, well, since we, you're not. We, we can't comment on security. Well, for obvious reasons. I, without going but into too much detail. But let me just tell you, I don't worry about them. They're nice and safe. <laughs> They're nice Good. and safe. And, and uh, you know, when, when, when initially when they were talking about running, that was what I was more concerned about. But uh, oh. there's, no, there's no reason to be worried. Good. Well, let's talk about that for just a minute because... Um, uh, another interesting story is that when, he, when uh, uh, Mr. Obama decided that he was going to run, um, the way I understand the story is that uh, your kids were, oh, he was a senator, your kids are over at his house and you had been, I guess, back east and had flown in to pick them up and you guys are standing around in the kitchen eating and he just, well, tell the story. Yeah, well, he, he comes out of nowhere. It's just like he s says, hey, you know, I think I'm going to do this and I'm thinking... Do what? It's like, you know, I think I'm going to run for the presidency. And I was like, whoa, you know, because that's not, you don't grow up on the south side of Chicago thinking that somebody's going to walk up to you who you're related to and say they're going to run for, pre for president of the United States. And so in, in the, a game of character, I go through what happened next. And... Um, he said, you know, I don't think that your mom and your sister are going to go for it. And uh, I said, yeah, well, you're probably right. And he said, would you mind talking to him? And it wasn't like he was asking permission or anything like that. He was just doing what a good family member would do. He was trying to build consensus. And he asked me to talk to him. So I went to my mom first because I knew she might be easier than going to my sister. And what I did was I used some of their own tactics that they used on me when I was thinking about leaving corporate America and going into coaching. 
you know, they, they, they talked about passion. They talked about doing what's best uh, for others. Uh, and, and, they talk, and I talk about in the book about opportunities. My, my, dad, my mom and dad always talked about you never know when an opportunity is going to arise and you have to be ready for it. And it's, it's some of the same things I tell my players today. But the biggest example I used was myself. I said, you know, I'm, I was at Brown University at the time. I was coaching in a small Ivy League school. And I said to my mom and eventually my sister, I said, you know, this is only my second year coaching as a head coach. But if they offered me the Kentucky job, I'd take it because it's an opportunity. I might not be ready for it, but I'd take it. And I, and I said to him, you can't penalize him for being good at what he is. And so my mom said, well, that's fine, but I don't think you're going to get your sister to go for it. <laughs> And we had the discuss I had the same discussion with my sister. And, and, you know, basically my sister was just concerned. She had, she had grown up in a household where Frazier Robinson worked shift, shift work and came home and played with the kids every day. And she could see that that wasn't going to be what her kids were going mm -hmm. to experience. And I think once she realized that their experience would be, could be just as rich but different, I think that's when she really signed on. Uh, you were, uh, worked quite a bit with the campaign. Um, tell me uh, what you think the most difficult day was, and what you. And aside from the actual uh, election and the inauguration, what you think the best day was, and as far as your experience with the campaign. Well, my experience with the campaign, the worst day was probably New Hampshire because we, the, the, uh, the campaign had this great success in Iowa, mm -hmm. and then you feel this momentum moving toward New Hampshire. And I don't know anything about the, the business of politics, so I should have known better because I'm a coach, but I was going in thinking the game was going to be won before it was played. So I didn't manage my expectations, so I was disappointed at that result. But as it turned out, that was a good, uh, that was a good sort of point in the campaign where people kind of pulled back the excitement and said, we still have a whole lot of work to do. So that was probably the most disappointing time. And the, the most exciting time, aside from the election and the inauguration, was probably the times when I got to go out and I went to South Carolina and did some uh, events down there. And this is more of a theme than one actual event, but I was thoroughly pleased with, um, well, being sort of the brother-in-law, I can be in without being in and I can be out without being out. Mm -hmm. I went would go around behind the scenes and it was apparent that people absolutely loved Barack's staff. They raved about how well they treated people, how polite they were, how genuine they were. Now these are the, these are the workers who, you know, they don't have to be nice to anybody. Uh, apparently that's what other campaigns had done. They were right. just not, it weren't as nice, and pe the people always commented on how nice they were. And, and when, you, when you bring it back to a game of character, it just it shows how um, you, have to, you have to stand for something and be something when people aren't watching. Mm -hmm. And I, I think what, said a lot, what says a lot about Barack and Michelle was how the people who worked for them behaved. And the, it was being able to be on the outside and looking in and being on the inside looking out, it was good, it was good to hear that. And it, would, it made me proud to be a part of it. Now you write quite a bit in the book uh, about how close the two of you are. You describe yourselves as being twins, even though you're, you're, you're two years apart. 
and, you know, and this is your little sister who, you know, helped you with girls and who taught you how to dance and who played practical jokes on you. And then in this campaign, there were some really ugly, nasty things that were said, you know, and that really, in, in my opinion, racist uh, New Yorker cover uh, that was out and some of the awful things. How does, does that a affect you? I mean, I know that she said and that Mr. Obama said that, hey, you know, you got to have a, t a tough skin, you got to have a thick skin. But, you know, this is your little sister. Yep, yep, you're right. But they're right too. You have to have tough skin. And um, in a game of character, I talk about how our parents spent a lot of time helping us build our self-esteem. And when you have a strong sense of self, the things people say that are negative don't bother you if they're not true. Do people get in your face? Rarely. I'm 6'6", six, six, about 250. They're not getting my face. <laughs> no, people have been really <laughs> gracious. Uh, you know, and being sort of a public figure on the sports side, right. I would say 95% of the people who come up to me or come up to my team in the airports or at hotels are completely positive. So it's, it is not something that is unbearable. And again, if you, uh, and for all you young people out there, if you think highly of yourself, no one can take that away. I always, I always love when, when I have players who say, well, this guy disrespected me. Well, he can't disrespect you. You can only disrespect yourself. You can't let what people say that is absolutely wrong bother you. And, I, and I, I, I talk about how, in a game of character, how my parents sort of set us up that way. All right, now you are a very, oh, we have some questions as well from the audience, thank you. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> All That's kinds like of questions. Cards. I need a bookmark for these yeah. questions, I think. <laughs> uh, before I get to these, I just want to mention, you, you are, um, are a very, very aggressive uh, recruiter. For, uh, for Oregon State. And you know, so you, you put so much emphasis on, on character. Hypothetically, mm -hmm. let's say that you found the, the, the greatest basketball player ever. You know, let's, let's say that you found the next Michael Jordan in a high school somewhere, but in okay. your opinion, the kid had absolutely no character, no scruples whatsoever. Would you recruit that kid? Well, Brian, that's what I'm here for. I mean, I, and, and I don't mean just winning games. I'm here to help kids like that who haven't had the benefit of a Frazier Marion Robinson or a Johnny Gage, who was my AAU coach that I talk about in the book, or a father, Carol, who was a teacher I had in, in the Catholic high school I went to. So it, it wouldn't be fair to be in this position and pass up a kid just, just because he's a tough kid a tough personality. But you, you wouldn't know, give him a pass just because he's good. I wouldn't give him a pass because he's good, but he would know going in, if he was coming to play for me, what he was in for. And, uh, and, and it's, it's all of our responsibilities to pass along what we've, or the, the values we've learned and the lessons we've learned, mm -hmm. especially to the kids who haven't had the benefit of the same kinds of information that no, we have. have been grounded like you were. Right. Oh, thanks. Okay, uh, let's see here. It says, uh, here's one that says, uh, with Barack's eclectic upbringing, how influential do you think that Michelle's cultural orientation has been on him as president? Well, you know, that's, that's a question I can answer this way. You know, you would be surprised, well, I guess you wouldn't be surprised, but I was surprised when I first met Barack, his background was completely different from ours. We, we, we had two parents in the home, raised on the south side of Chicago, um, and his couldn't have been any more different. He had single parents, uh, single parent raised by his grandparents, multiracial, but our values were almost identical. That's why there was the attraction, I think. I think that they both were from the same stock, just took different routes. I was watching uh, her, uh, the uh, biographical video that they had at the DNC, and when she said she first heard his name, she said, who names their kid Barack Obama? That's what I, I think that's what all of us said. <laughs> Well, your parents didn't think it was going to last, right? You're, 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 no, 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 no. They didn't think, but not because of 
him. No, because of her. Because of her, and she, like I mentioned earlier, she hadn't had any real long-term relationships. So, you know, when my parents met him, they were thinking, oh, it's too bad. <laughs> seems like a nice guy. <laughs> Didn't your dad say that, that she'll lead him alive? Yeah, she'll lead him alive. She'll lead him alive, he said. But. Uh, did you try out with a professional team before you played in Europe? And at what positions? You were the 76ers drafted you, right? Yes. Uh, this was back in the prehistoric times when they had 10 rounds of the draft. That was a fourth round draft pick by the Philadelphia 76ers the year after they won the championship. And I made it through rookie free agent camp, then through the summer league. And then right before the veterans camp started, I got cut and was fortunate enough to get picked up by a team in Manchester, England to play. And I played two years professionally over there. Okay. And then after that, you went into the corporate world. And after that, I went into the corporate world and uh, went into investment banking and financial uh, uh, finance and uh, did that for about 14 years. I got my MBA along the way at the University of Chicago. And then, uh, and then that's, I switched after 14, almost 14 years, I switched over to coaching. Yeah, you, you write about how you were just making just obscene money and you had a, well, you had a BMW station wait, wagon? Wait, did I say obscene money in the book? <laughs> Maybe I you just said, said money. I, I, I was making a nice living and... You had a BMW station wagon. I Who did, has a BMW I station wagon? I did say that in the book. I mean, no one has a BMW station wagon. I mean, that, that seems a bit ex excessive, but I did. Uh, and... Uh, but you weren't happy. I, I wasn't happy. I didn't enjoy it. And, and no offense to anybody who's got a BMW station wagon, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Just point there. But I, I, wasn't, I, I, I wasn't passionate about what I was doing. And I talk about in a game of character how when you're in the investment banking world, you're compensated to do well for yourself not for others. And I'm more of a giving person and I missed that part. I was missing that in my life and uh, uh, that's when I made the decision that I would go into coaching. Okay, now, now returning back to the question of, of, of character and in, investment banking, you know, we've got the, the big scandal with Goldman Sachs right yeah. now. Are you surprised, you've been out of it for a long, how many years since you've, since it's you've been, been out ten, of it? I've been coaching for 10 years okay, so, now. So you've been out of it for 10 years. Um, was the business 10 years ago, uh, how shall I put this, um, would you, do you feel that the business is le less ethical or more ethical or the same or has there been any, any, right. any changes in terms of character and ethics back when you were doing it as opposed to what we're reading about and what's coming to light now? Yeah, that's, that's a tough question because I haven't been f following the industry just from what I'm reading. Did in the people the, you work with, had, the people you dealt with all those years, did most of them have character and ethics? Some of them did, but some of them didn't. But it's the same thing in coaching. Some of them have ethics, some of them don't. It's the way the world is. Some people choose to do things by the rules and other people choose to skirt around them. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's industry driven. I think it's everywhere. All right, here's another question. Here's a great one. Okay. What are the chances of a Dominican versus Oregon State exhibition next season? <laughs> All right, who wrote that question? <laughs> yeah, I, that's what I thought. <laughs> Come on, you can bring the team down in your BMW station wagon. No. I, you know, not next season, but let's talk about the following season because our exhibitions are, are done for this season. So let's, let's, let's see. Depends on how good you guys are. Yeah, right. See, that means you're good. <laughs> <laughs> I saw those banners back there on the wall. Uh, here's one who says, uh, there are many parents who focus on sports, especially in the African-American community. Do you overemphasize, or do we overemphasize sports in America? Should we put academics ahead of athletics? And should our role models be medical doctors instead of Dr. J? So you dated yourself with that. But should, instead of basketball players? You know, uh, the answer is yes. We should put academics first. And we should do it just because that's the right thing to do. But no one ever believes me, or, or no one ever does it. So you should do it because none of, most people don't make it in the pros. 
the numbers are against you. I was really good. I didn't make it. Most really good guys don't make it. It's a numbers game. You don't have enough jobs for the number of people who are going for it. Now, this brings me to a, a, another, uh, another sort of point that I bring out in the book. I was very fortunate to have people who cared enough about me um, to kind of give me that advice many years ago. My dad always said, and, and I talk about this in the book, don't just be a guy who plays one position. Be a guy who can play basketball. And what that means is, you know, don't be just a guard, be able to do everything. Well, it's the same thing when you, when you extrapolate it out. Don't be just a basketball player. Be a good student, too. Then that way you cover both bases, and then if you're fortunate enough to play professionally, great. But if you're not, you have a degree to fall back on, an education to fall back on. Now, this brings me to another, something I just thought of. Um, oh, about a month ago, I went to a Warrior game, and like, in between plays, they had one of these contest things where they showed pictures of, of current Warriors as little kids, two, three, four years old, and the, the game was to guess who each kid was. Mm -hmm. And each one of these kids, I mean, they're two, three, four years old, they're all in basketball jerseys in the pictures, they've all got basketballs. And I'm looking at this thinking, how much did their parents push them into this? And how much are their parents living through them the reason that they got to where it is they got? I mean, these are, these are toddlers in these pictures. Right. You know, people ask me, are kids different now than they were back then? And kids are not any different. They, they try to run the same scams I tried to run. <laughs> They're the same kids, but you know what's different? The parents are different. The parents are different. You know, you, you know a lot of coaches have 13 sets of parents who all think their kids are gonna be NBA players. Mm -hmm. And it's out of love, obviously, but how about having your kid think they're gonna be the next doctor or the next lawyer or but what about the argument, though, that somebody's got to make it? I mean, look at it this way. Who would have believed your brother-in-law at 12? He would have said, I'm going to be the first black president of the United States. That's okay. You can have those dreams, but have a fallback plan. Have a fallback plan. And, and it's what, what, what's disappointing to me is that you, in order to play basketball, and it's probably most sports, you have to have some kind of intelligence. Basketball is a very strategic game. So if you can play basketball, you're not dumb. And if you're not dumb, you can do well in school. And that's what I emphasize with my team at Oregon State. And I talk about it in a game of character. Our best player my first year there didn't go to class. So therefore, he didn't play. And then when he saw that we were winning without him and that he wasn't going to play until he started going to class, he started going to class. And then by the end of the year, he was one of our best students. So, you know, it's on us. It's on all of us to emphasize it. Coaches, parents, teachers, the whole nine yards. Uh, have you and your sister been able to keep the same family closeness with your own children, given your careers and your time on the road? Uh, that's a good question. The answer is yes. I, I, I know my sister is able to do it, uh, but I'm, I've been able to do it. There, there is, aside from doing a book tour, most of the, my travel is in and out. So. I actually have more time to spend with my kids because I, I can, you know, we practice early in the morning and uh, so I get to most of their activities and uh, it's, it's a whole lot more, ex I'm a whole lot more accessible now than I was when I was an investment banker. Oh, I'll bet. Uh, here's one that says, what are your goals for OSU for 2010-2011? You know, we, I want to see what our new recruits are going to be like, but we've had two really good recruiting classes, and we've dropped off a couple of uh, uh, senior classes. So we're going to be young, but we're going to be better. And uh, we start, but my first year, we, we were ninth out of 10. This year, we were fifth, and we're trying to be first. So our goal is to make it to the NCAA tournament and win a Pac-10 championship. Good luck. What is it like to be the uncle of the president's children, and how would you discipline them if needed? Well, the, uh, 
it feels great, you know, it's, it's fun to be an uncle, and it's no different. I mean, you know, our family doesn't operate any differently just because they're in the White House. And how I would discipline them would be how I discipline my own children. You have to be, you have to be strict, but you have to be fair. So if they, if they cross the line, then they have to be punished, and if they uh, uh, don't cross the line, then they're, they're doing what they're supposed to do. And the punishments that we have in our household are the, the kind of the same things I talk about in a game of character. I mean, there's n no television, uh, no iPods, no cell phones, no basketball. Those are the kinds of things. You just take away what kids want, and, and, and they pretty much do what you want them to do. There's no, pretty much, because sending a kid to his room now is not punishment. No, you send a kid to his room now, some of these kids have more stuff in their room than I have in my family room. So, uh, no, it, it I, I've been very fortunate. My kids are, you know, well, I do what Frazier and Marion did to me. That's basically what I did. I copied what they did and, and added and added, tweaked it a little bit for the, for the, the times, but it's the same mm -hmm. stuff. It's discipline, it's uh, emphasis on education, and it is relentlessness. I talk about this in the book. You have to be relentless when it comes to dealing with young people. You can't tire, you can't tire out before they do. You just can't. That's a tough charge. It is. <laughs> but I it's tell you, task. when I think about the hard work that Frazier Robinson did with MS, and you know, I talk about in the book how I never saw him walk without a limp, and it got progressively worse. And he went he, to work every he day. He went to work every day. And I mean, folks, I am not exaggerating. I think he missed four days of work my entire life. And he always would come home from a shift and be willing to do stuff. If he came if he worked nights, which meant he worked from 10 at night to 6 in the morning, he'd fix breakfast before we went to school, and then he'd sleep. If he, if he worked days, he'd come home at 5 in the evening and not be too tired to go out and play ball, shoot hoops, go to the park. Uh, and when he worked afternoons, I think that's when he rested because he would leave while we were at school and come home while we were in bed. So I'm sure he went right to bed. He passed away on his, on his way to work. Is that correct? Yeah, he got sick got on sick. his way, to, way work. to work, and then those were, I mean, you know, he got sick and then died very quickly. It was like in three or four days. Your um, uh, sister has made uh, childhood obesity one of her, her major causes uh, since being first lady. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, do you uh, watch what you eat when you're around your sister? Do you eat junk in front of her? No, I, I can eat what I want because I work out. You know, exercise, you know, so everything in mod moderation. No, she'd probably say something. She saw me eat, like, you know, a greasy hamburger every day. But, you know, I, I don't think the war on obesity means, you know, not treating yourself. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's more about exercise and eating right most of the time. I think if, if people eat right most of the time and exercise a lot, you're, you, you'd be in good shape. Okay, I'll ask you the People Magazine question now, too, because oh, okay. her arm, because, you know, she's got these cut arms. What's she do? <laughs> she works I mean, she always out. talks about how buffed her arms are. She works out. My sister works out a lot, uh, and she's, you know, she's an athlete in her own right, mm -hmm. but she, you know, I talk about a little, this a little bit in the book. She, she, she shied away from sports in high school because she was the type who didn't like the fact that somebody had to lose. Not just her, but anybody. Right. It was like she was, you know, too nice. And I was like trying to beat guys on the court, you know. All right. Uh, when growing up in the streets, how would you judge character in a person? And if I didn't have a chance to take them to the basketball court, right. I'd watch how they operated. I'd watch how they, I, I'd watch the things that they do. You know, you have to, yeah, at some point, you catch people when they're off their guard, and, and you really have to, have to pay attention closely. Here's a great question to wrap it up. Uh, there are a lot of kids here from the Phoenix program. Please tell them what you look for with young student athletes and give them tips on how to succeed. That's a, that is a good question. Um, 
what I look for in kids is a, from a, from a coaching standpoint, you have to be good enough because it wouldn't be do me any good to recruit you if you weren't able to play at this level. It would just be frustrating. Secondly, most importantly, you have to have a respect for your academics. You don't have to be magna cum laude. You just have to respect the academic process. And what that means, and I talk about this in a game of character, my players have to go to class. They have to sit in the front. They have to take their ear iPods out of their ears. They have to take their hats off. And they have to show respect to the person who's standing at the front of the class. That's half the battle in college. Most of these uh, academicians here will tell you. People love, professors love kids who are interested in what they're talking about. So if you just show some interest, that's half the battle. That's half the battle. So it is, uh, uh, respect for academics is a huge part. And, and it helps if you're not, uh, a troublemaker, but most, the, most, most kids aren't troublemakers. They're just misguided. Well, the book is A Game of Character. I recommend not only that you read it, but that you get, get two copies. Get one for yourself, get one for your kids. Definitely get one for your kids. Peg Robinson, Thank it's you. been a pleasure. Thanks, it's Brian. really, this really been great. a pleasure. Man. This has been fun. Uh, I, I also want to thank Craig and, and Brian for their conversation today. I forgot to thank one other person. I need to do that. You know, when I was introducing John Allen earlier, it was his vision and courage that helped move this institution from small college NAIA to Division II of NCAA, which is a big deal for a relatively small institution like that. And, and to implement the policies and establish the program, we hired a terrific guy as our athletic director. And that's Terry Toomey. So I want to thank him, number one, for what he did with us tonight by helping put this together. Number two, because he's guiding us on a very successful path towards NCA 2. But to your point, he's also creating a, a core of student athletes. And the grade point average of our, our athletes is higher than the grade point average of the student body at large. So Terry, stand up and say hey. So we win on the court and off the court. On behalf of uh, Elaine and Bill Petricelli and Book Passage and Dr. Denise Lucy and the Institute for Leadership Development, ladies and gentlemen, let me say good night, God bless, careful driving, and Greg's willing to sign a few books before he leaves. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>